Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated, truly, truly is. Before you get started, let me give you my usual disclaimer. This video is for educational purposes only. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research and come to your own conclusions. Next. If you have not liked, subscribed, or comment it yet, please consider doing so. It really helps me out and I really, really appreciate it. Okay, so today we're talking Brandon Duran. Brandon Mark Duran was born on June 24th, 1980 in San Diego, California to parents Cindy and Mark. Growing up, he was very active in sports that included Little League BMX racing, snowboarding, golf, hockey, and motorcycle riding. He worked very hard for the Sheet Metal Union Local 206. His parents divorced in 1983 and his mother got remarried to a man named Dane and they would go on to have a son together named Garrett. His father relocated to New Mexico but Mark and Cindy were committed to giving their son a good upbringing. So they would fly Brandon back and forth from New Mexico to California. So he could be a part of both of their lives. His father was part of a motorcycle club called the Banditos. So it's said that they're considered a criminal club and that they're one step under the Hells Angels. I don't really know. But that's what is being said. In April of 2005, Brandon's father would tragically die from a blood disease. And Brandon was very, very close to his father and he took the death of his father extremely hard. It actually sent him into a pretty bad depression. Shortly after this, Brandon decides to relocate to Las Vegas so that he could be closer to his father's motorcycle friends. Because in his mind, moving to Las Vegas and being close to his father's motorcycle friends is the best way for him to remain close to his dad. He really, really loved his, not that he didn't love his mother. I don't mean that, but he really, really loved his dad. Okay, let me say, Brandon was not part of the Banditos motorcycle gang. He was only friends with them. And in most cases, something like this would never, ever fly. But they made an exception because he was part of his father's legacy. And they knew how much this meant to him. So I suppose that even motorcycle gang members have a soft spot for certain situations. So that's kind of refreshing, right? Uh, Brandon would get a construction job while he was out there. And with the new skills that he's taught on the job, he is able to make an urn for his father's ashes that he kept in his house and that he cherished. While in Las Vegas, he would also meet and fall in love with a 23-year-old tattoo artist named Amber Andrews, and the two would begin dating. Less than a year into dating, Amber would find out that she was pregnant, and the couple would marry just two months later at a wedding chapel in downtown Las Vegas. The pair decided to wed on June 6, 2006, or 666, the day of the devil. This is quite fitting for Amber, if I'm being honest, because she is, by all accounts, the fucking devil. She's horrible. December 15, 2006. Amber would give birth to a healthy baby boy that the couple would decide to name Brando Marcus Duran. Brandon even had a picture of his father in the delivery room when his son was being born. Like I said, he really loved his dad. After they bring baby Brando home, Amber decides to quit working so she could stay home and she could raise the baby. So she basically leaves the sole financial responsibility on Brandon's shoulders. But Brandon didn't care. He just did what he had to do to make sure that his wife and his child were taken care of. 
but it wouldn't take Amber very long to decide that she was overplaying the doting mother role around the clock and she would begin going out on a consistent basis. I don't think there's anything wrong with going out after you become a mother. Like, I, I don't. I think that you, you still need adult interactions. But when my first baby was born, it literally took me at least a year to leave her to have a night out with my girlfriends. And when I did, I couldn't wait to get back to my baby. So going out every single night or every other night when you have a baby at home is not something that I could personally relate to. I just can't. I don't understand it. Once in a while, I think that absolutely you need to do that. Excessively, I don't agree with. I don't. She would begin fights with Brandon just so that she would have a reason to leave the house for the night. And then when she would return in the early hours of the morning, she would have smeared makeup, messed up hair, and booze coming out of her pores. Again, not something that you should do when you have a brand new baby at home. It's just not. And your husband is working around the clock to provide for you and your baby. It's a little selfish there, lady. When Brandon would try to have conversations with her about the excessive partying, she would fight with him. He even told friends that she would hit him repeatedly and she wouldn't stop. Once she took their argument so far that she grabbed the urn that Brandon made for his dad with his father's ashes inside of it, took it and threw threw it outside on the lawn. Imagine watching the person that you love, the mother of your child, the person that you believed loved you, take one of your most prized possessions and a possession that is 1 billion percent irreplaceable because you can never replace that and tossing it outside simply because you questioned why they're going out every night or every other night and leaving you and your newborn baby at home. The marriage had become so toxic that in 2010, Brandon decided to file for divorce. Amber decided to move back to Oklahoma and the pair agreed to joint custody of their son because again, Brandon just wanted what was best for his son. That's all he ever wanted. So Brandon would see his son and then when it was time to return him to Amber, he would return Brando to Amber for her visits. But then Amber would refuse to give Brando back to Brandon so he could have his time with his son. She also refused to answer calls about her whereabouts. She would basically just disappear and not call, not show up. Oh, well. Again, that's not a mother. You don't do shit like that, okay? You just don't do it. I'm a divorced mother. And you know what? There's been a lot of times, a lot of times that I had to suck it up because I knew this is what is best for my children. It's not easy, but... When you have your children in mind and when your children are your number one priority, it's just what you do, period. After repeated instances of this, Brandon decided that enough was enough and he hired himself a lawyer, as he should. And although the details of that hearing are unknown, what is known is that the judge decided to stop Amber's shenanigans in their tracks and awarded Brandon full custody of Brando, as he should. After the court proceedings were over, Brandon decided to move back to San Diego to have a fresh start and to be closer to his family. So they moved back to San Francisco and things are going great. 
An entire year would go by with no word from Amber. Brandon and his son had transitioned into their new normal and life was, by all accounts, pretty great for them. Brandon had even been on a few dates since the divorce. Then in 2012, seemingly out of nowhere, Amber decides to phone Brandon and ask him to consider a reconciliation. Because, again, Brandon loved his son and just wanted what was best for him. He didn't want his son to grow up in a broken home. And because he still loved Amber, which I think was a major factor, he decided to give it a go. Friends of Brandon would say that he considered Amber like a drug. Someone he just couldn't shake. And even though he had been on a few dates with some really great girls, he said that they just weren't Amber. Not realizing that anyone that wasn't Amber was exactly what he needed in life. Anything but Amber is what he needed in life. But he loved her and... In July of 2012, Brandon shows up to his family home with Amber. To say the family was shocked and disappointed would be an understatement. But the heart wants what the heart wants, so the family had no choice but to sit back and hope for the best. The only request that Amber had was that they take the baby to Oklahoma for one week to visit her family before the baby starts kindergarten. Brandon agrees and the family pack up the truck. They put Brandon's prized motorcycle in the bed of the truck and they go off to Oklahoma to visit Amber's family like they planned. August 7th, 2012. Amber's friend Erin agrees to watch Brando for the couple so that Brandon could take Amber to a doctor's appointment. She says that at 3 o'clock, Amber receives a text message that says the ink is ready. Which we'll get to, but it's later determined that that was like a go sign. After she gets the text message, she rushes Brandon out of the house and then she accidentally grabs Erin's phone by mistake. When Erin realizes this, she calls Amber's phone repeatedly. No, she calls her phone from Amber's phone repeatedly, telling her, you have my phone, where are you? But she gets no answer. She doesn't hear back from Amber and her phone is turned off for hours. And it doesn't get turned back on until right before she shows up back to the house. When Amber finally shows up to the house without Brandon, she tells her friend that while they were driving to the doctor's appointment, she brought up her ex-boyfriend Justin Hammer's name. She says that from there, Brandon got so mad that he pulled over the truck took his motorcycle out of the bed of the truck and drove off saying that he was going to Justin's house to confront him and to tell him to stay the hell away from his girl. Could that scenario be true? I mean, yeah, a scenario like that absolutely could happen, but I, I I would think that you would follow him, right? Like, I would have jumped in the driver's seat and I would have followed him to stop it. But she didn't. But she was also missing. She was off the grid for hours. So where were you all those hours? So this obviously raises a lot of red flags, as it should. And this is why I believe she didn't grab Erin's phone by accident. I personally think she knew exactly what she was doing and she took her friend's phone on purpose so that her phone would be at the house for the t entire night. That's what I think. That's my conspiracy. They haven't said it, but I do strongly believe that that's what really happened. August 8th, 2012. 
police receive a call from 31-year-old Van Emblem, and he's requesting to speak to police about a murder. He tells police that his childhood best friend called him up the night before at about 9 p.m. and asked him to come over and help him clean up a crime scene. He says that he thought that his friend was fucking with him at first, but that was until he went there and he saw five concrete buckets with blood running down them. He says, frozen in fear, he helped Justin take the buckets and put them in the bed of his truck, but then told him that he could not be a part of anything else, and he left. After he left Justin's house, he went home, he hired a lawyer, and he called police. So, obviously, police believe him because he had so many details, and actually, um, He's actually, Van is not treated as a criminal at all. He's completely treated as a witness and he's actually giving immunity for, I mean, because technically he was an accessory after the fact, but because of the way he handled it, he was given complete immunity, which I think was the right thing to do. I do. So from there, police begin surveying Justin's home and wait. Once he gets into his car and pulls away, police pull him over for like a minor traffic stop and ask him to step out of the car and bring him down to the station for questioning. Once there, Justin admits to killing Brandon, but says that he did it in self-defense. So Justin's story goes as follows. He was sitting home, minding his own business, when all of a sudden Brandon pulls up to his house on his motorcycle, kicks the door in, starts screaming at him and walking towards him. Fearful for his life, he says that he was able to grab hold of a rifle and shoot Brandon in the face. It goes on to say that after he killed Brandon, he didn't know what to do, so he decided to put his body in the pond behind his home. August 9th, 2012. Police arrest Justin Hammer for the murder of Brandon, then immediately drain the pond in the back of the home before any evidence could be tampered with. While there, police retrieve five buckets of concrete and a dog cage. Okay. Inside the bucket were body parts and saws, while the inside of the dog cage was a human torso. Police would find 25 pieces of body parts and all 25 pieces belonged to Brandon Duran. When officers checked out the home of Justin, they found quite a bit of evidence that would contradict Justin's claims of self-defense. For starters, the door was kicked in, except it was kicked in from the inside out, not the outside in. Not very smart there, are you, Justin? I'm just saying, it's common sense. There was also a footprint on the inside of the door that matched perfectly to a pair of sneakers that belonged to Justin Hall. Again, not the sharpest knife in the drawer, now are you, Justin? Then they find a safe. Inside the safe, they find multiple guns and what looked like a grocery list of sorts, except this was no ordinary grocery list. Like there were not apples, bananas, uh, milk, and bread on this list, okay? This list read more like, what do I need to cut up a body and clean up a crime scene? With things that included saws, blades, meat grinder, gas cans, five-gallon buckets, tarps, extension cords, vacuum, carpet cleaner, bleach, carpet cleaner solution, ammonia, clothes, boots, and empty burn barrels. Not getting that at your local shop, right? Just saying. Police also get surveillance video of Justin Hall at the store on August 6th, the day before the murder, purchasing the things on this list. 
After the medical examiner is done, he informs police that Brandon was actually shot four times with two different that Justin never mentioned. He was shot three times in the back of the head with a handgun and once in the face with a rifle standing over him at point blank range. Both weapons that were used were found in the safe at Justin's home. So, after speaking to the medical examiner, police determined that there were obviously two people involved in this crime. Of course, there were two people involved in this crime. For starters, there are zero reasons that you would need to shoot somebody four times in the head in self-defense. That It doesn't work like that. That's not self-defense, okay? That is murder. But more importantly, you wouldn't switch guns in the process. Police find Amber 99 miles away at her mother's home and they tell her about Brandon and she's visibly shaken. Of course she is. She tells police the same story that she told her friend Erin that they got into a fight. He pulled over the car. He got his motorcycle out of the bed of the truck and he drove to Justin Hall's house to confront him. Okay. Only problem was that at the time of the murder, Brandon's bike wasn't working and it wasn't a quick fix either. So there is no way that he could have rode the bike to Justin's house because the bike wasn't working. It was inoperable. Next, they called the doctor's office and the doctor's office confirmed that Amber did not show up to her appointment that day. So where the hell were you, Amber? I know where you were. You were cutting a body. That's where the hell you were. You stupid bitch. Please next take the list that they find in the safe and a document from Justin's home that Amber had signed her signature on and they give it to a handwriting specialist. The handwriting specialist would confirm that the handwriting on the list was that of Amber Andrews. Of course it was. It is believed that Amber drove Brandon to Justin Holt's home. When they got there, they got out of the car and Amber shot him three times in the back of the head. After he was down, Justin shot him in the face with the rifle. The two then cut up Brandon into 25 pieces, burn his clothing in the burn bucket that was on the list, and take apart his prized possession, his bike, to give away for scraps. Justin, Hall, Justin Hall's trial began in July of 2014. While on trial, Amber remained a free woman. It is said that the reason for this was that after the state was done trying Justin Hall, they could solely focus on trying Amber next. Justin Hall would be found guilty on October 6, 2014 and sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. Amber's trial began in April of 2017 and on June 12, 2017, the jury found Amber Andrews guilty of first degree murder and sentenced her to life in prison with no chance of parole plus another 17 years for the desecration of a human body. But it doesn't even stop there because after the trial, Brandon's mother would have to face a three year long battle trying to win custody of her grandson. And the only thing left on this planet that is part of her baby boy. Why she had to go through such a huge legal battle, I will never understand. But all that matters at this point is that she won the fight she got custody of her beautiful grandson. He's happy. He's thriving. Minus missing the hell out of his daddy. This is going to be, you know, the most wonderful Christmas, you know, that we could actually have as much as we can without my son. Let the jury see me. And then when they call the first witness, I leave. 
because there are things in there that I can't hear, I can't see, that no mother should ever have to know about their child. I am empty without children, and I have so much to give, and my grandson will be showered with all of the knowledge and love and God I can give him. <laughs> Okay, guys, if you're still here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you and appreciate you so very much. Please leave me a like and a comment. Please subscribe if you haven't yet and you feel so inclined to do so. Tell me what you thought. And until next time, stay safe out there.